All right, this morning, I was spent numerous weeks thinking, Lord, what is it that I need? <laughs> I had talked to Paul Auckland, and I had talked to Ben, and I said, in the past when I used to preach, I never preached to the people that are sitting in front of me. I preach to myself. And somewhere along the line, something will apply to you. I have struggles, issues, and things in my life aren't always what they appear to be. Neither are yours, I'm sure. So the scripture text this morning, starting off with is Galatians chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9. In the word it says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this shall he also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And do not let us lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. Before I continue, let's pray. Father, you're an amazing God. And I ask that your word become, um, it is real to us, but may it penetrate our heart, my heart this morning. As we all need the word to be the mirror, our truth, our guideline of our, the way that we live, we conform to your word, your image. And again, I'm thankful for everyone here this morning of how you have directed us, moved us, and guided us to this point. You are so good. May we not forget that. Amen. Do not be deceived. The interesting thing about this is that Paul states it. And the question I like to go is, why? To me, the obvious was that we get deceived. I get deceived. So he tells us, do not get deceived. If we wouldn't get deceived, he wouldn't have to say that. We go back to Genesis and we say, well, Eve was deceived, but Adam knew full well what he did. This is true. But men get deceived just as much as women. <laughs> I don't think it's a race who gets deceived more. We just get deceived. We deceive ourselves. But why does Paul say this? To me, it's a reminder that I'm deceived, but I don't know I'm deceived. If I knew I was deceived, then I wouldn't be deceived. <laughs> I know, it's like, I'm no rocket scientist, but it's just simple truth. And yet it trips us up so much. And I thought, says, well, where does deception come from? And Revelation 20, 10, states that, and the devil who deceived them. Obviously, no, it's not God who does the deceiving, it's the enemy. But it's not just the enemy. In 1 John 3, 7, it says, little children, let no man deceive you. So we have people deceive us. And I believe the enemy is one who is even crowding people, getting them to deceive, getting us to fall. And I know one of the reasons why I'm, I'm sharing this is because when it's pointed out that I am deceived, I hate it. Because that means I'm being tricked by the enemy. No one likes to be tricked. Oh. Jacob didn't like being tricked, thinking he was getting Rachel and landed up with Leah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. We hate it. 
we hate, I hate to be deceived. And yet, I am. Until I'm shown that I'm not. How do we move from one point to the other? I think one of the things that's difficult is we don't want to take a look at ourselves. Self-examination is painful. Most of us avoid pain. Why? Because pain hurts. I don't like to feel pain. And neither do you. But sometimes that's the place where we need to go. And one of the things that has helped me out is people in my life who had to show me where I was deceived. Most times I'm not smart enough to figure it out myself. And a few people are encouraging in that way. One would be my wife. She has the freedom and the courage to let me know when I am deceived. I do the same with her. And she is kind and loving and I try to be that way too. But yet something in ourselves, uh, different times you've heard Paul Auckland use the word blind spots, that we have blind spots, the things that we don't see in ourselves but others see in us. So somehow my encouragement as we go through this would be that it would be neat, and maybe you already do, have someone in your life, a spouse, significant other, friend, who could be honest enough and real enough and say, hey, this is what I see in you. And then at that point, you have a decision to make. Do I, since you're, let's say, no longer deceived because something's been pointed out, now you're at a crossroads. You have to make a decision. Do I change? Do I repent, which basically means a 180 degree turnabout? Or do I allow myself to stay the same, refuse to repent? That's a tough thing to do, because change is hard. And usually when somebody tells you something difficult, you want to get defensive. Not me. No, that's you. Uh, no, you don't assess the situation right. I'm right. You're wrong. We, we argue these things, and oftentimes people see us more than we see ourselves. I wrote this down. When someone confronts you with something about yourself that you don't like and you don't believe it, get defensive or won't take a moment to consider what was spoken, you probably are deceived and probably most likely self-deception. So when someone shares something tough with you, I try to take it in. I try not to get defensive and listen, because I don't always get it right. I wish I did, but I don't. And what happens if you refuse to change, then maybe you're choosing to live in denial. Which is what I did for many years. And if someone is honest enough to confront you, like what happened to me in 1994, you should thank that person. <laughs> Because I hate being deceived, especially when it's the enemy. Oh, and then if I get deceived by someone, a person, I can put a face to it. Then that really hurts. I have an example I'd like to share about my own personal deception. And uh, I did ask Lynn permission to say this. 
And she even added, make sure you say this too, <laughs> which I will do. Um, 1991, I thought things were going pretty well. I was in full-time ministry and things looked really great. It seemed like fruit was being happening. And I probably was spending, no, not probably, I was spending too much time in the ministry. Some weeks I was putting in 70 hours. And uh, Lynn felt like a single mom with three kids. But I was having a blast in the ministry. And I didn't see my error, and in 1991 said, you need help, you need counseling. And what do I say? No, I don't. My thoughts were, you do, not me. 1992, Brian, you could use some help. Why don't you seek someone? No, I don't need help. I didn't tell her, I was like, oh no, you do. 1993, and during these years, things are not getting any better. Uh, things just don't get fixed by magic. So, 93 came and gone, and I had switched jobs. I left the ministry, and during this time, I knew there were some things wrong with me. And I thought there was more wrong with others than me. And I didn't see a necessity to change. But sometimes, Lynn did give me enough of signs to see that our marriage was not going well. We talk about not running on eight cylinders, maybe we were running on five, maybe not even five. Am I really, for the first time, I thought, if I continue the same path, it, it's not going to last. So she said, again, in 94, let's go see someone. I really didn't want to. And Lynn asked me why. And this is what she told me to tell you. My response to her was that I thought all the blame would be put back on me. Even though I didn't think I was the problem. But I guess I did, but didn't. I don't know if that makes any sense, but... And I'm thinking, yeah, they're going to point out things. That I'm pointing a finger at my wife, and there's three more pointing back at me, but I didn't see it that way. So we finally, I finally agreed to counseling because I knew something needed to happen. And so we went to a counselor, and it took a while. And that's why I'm patient with people. For three years, my wife was patient with me. You need help, you need help, you need help. No, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't. Yes, I do. So we went for counseling, and the counselor was someone that I thought I would trust. And by the way, another reason why I didn't want to go to counseling 25 years ago, I didn't trust anybody. I wouldn't have trusted any one of you with any part of my life 25 years ago. Didn't trust you. I really had nowhere to turn, but I know I need to turn somewhere. So upon agreeing to counseling, this uh, gentleman, who I respected, gave us some advice, told me to buy a book and read it. So it would help Lynn and I to grow together and help solve our problem. We're into this about three, four months, and all these things to do. And on the outward appearance, and even somewhat on the inside, I thought, oh, wow, things look a little better. And I can remember about three months into it, boom, 
it got three times worse than what it was. Why? Because I was given something to do. And it didn't work. How many th times do you like to be told what to do? And then just gladly do it? Probably not. So now I'm like, really don't want to go to counseling because if I go to someone else again, and the same thing happens, it, it, it's done, it's there, uh, we're finished. But I knew I needed help. So then we sought another counselor. <coughs> And this time it was different, okay? I'm gonna put this definition up because it's in the word about the scripture that I read it said about uh, do not grow weary. Folks, I was weary. So was Lynn. Weary means to give up, become discouraged, lose heart. Uh, obviously we didn't give up, but yes, we were discouraged and uh, lost heart. That's a bad place to be. Bad place to be, I was there. And by God's grace, through counseling for 10 months, every other week, every other Monday night, by telling my story, uh, to this gentleman who was the assistant pastor of the church we were going at the time, his name was Darrell. And by telling him things of my past, he began to show me who I was. And one of the first things that I learned about myself that the area where I was deceived. I was deceived in a number of areas. I, it was discovered and I learned that I was the king of shifting blame. It's your fault, not mine. And guess what? If it's your fault and not mine, I don't need to change. I don't need to repent. I don't really need to grow. Problem's not me. And all of a sudden, through conversation, him spending time, instead of him giving me something to do, gave me something to be. He got to the heart. And I was at a place where I wanted God to change me. But I struggled. Because I didn't know how to change me. And to this day, folks, I still don't know how to change me. But God does. So I was taught to put myself in a position where God is willing. He's always willing to change. But sometimes we harden our hearts to where we won't change. Like the Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. He wasn't going to change. So one of the prayers that I would say five times a day, Lord, change my heart, even though I don't want to change. Change my heart. I don't want to change. There's nothing in my flesh that wants to change. Other people should change. But Lord, change my heart. And this whole process took 10 months. So if you come to me and you have some struggles, I'm not going to give you anything to fix you. <laughs> but I'll take you and show you the one who does change the heart. Not me. There again, I don't even know how to change my own heart. I can't. But I can put myself in a place 
that makes God willing to change where he does change. I think God is always willing, but we're not. And that's not easy. And I think one of the, the difficult things with the scripture is just what I struggle with and we all struggle with is just obedience. And in 1 John 5, 3, that's how we show that we love him, by we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. But one of the things I think we struggle with, and this is hard, and this was hard for me, this passage of scripture may be hard to see. I'm going to read it. It's Matthew 11, 25 through 30. This is the words of Jesus. I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and in earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and didst reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight that all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to him the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my load is light. You see a picture up there of a yoke. It's designed for two oxen, not one. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. One of the areas that I struggle with is to picture Jesus on one side and me on the other. Where we live, where I live too often is me on one side and who knows what's on the other. That's not going to make it happen in life for you. You will be frustrated. You'll be tired, you'll be weary, you'll be like, uh, I can remember coming to the point years ago, you know, I like this Christianity thing, but the people in the church mess it up. I don't want to go to church. And I stand here probably more messed up than anyone. <laughs> some things I know, some things I don't. I'm still deceived. And when I am shown... I'm confronted and need to change. The statement here, farmers use yoke to bind their oxen together, so yokes come to represent labor, service, or submission to authority. See, we see that a lot with folks today, maybe even the, I hate to pick on the younger generation, I think us who are really struggle with submission to authority too, because we want to be in control and not have someone control us. Yokes are oppressive when the ones in charge are harsh and cruel, but the Lord's commands are not burdensome. Christ's servants can find rest and refreshment in him even when work is difficult and stressful. So Jesus says to come join him for his yoke is easy. Well, and it's light, but yet it's still work. Your stress isn't going to go away and disappear. The hard times are not going to go away forever. It's still going to be difficult at times. But it's probably almost impossible to make it without Christ. You're probably not going to be healthy. You need Jesus. Take his yoke. And upon reading this verse, it was interesting, in verse 29, Jesus quotes Jeremiah when Jeremiah says, You shall find rest for your souls. The prophet Jeremiah said that. And I'm going to have to turn there because uh, I realize my eyes aren't what they should be. The last uh, statement in this verse is the key that I want to hit on that when I read it, I had different thoughts going through my mind. The prophet Jeremiah, some people call him the weeping prophet. 
It's interesting. This is what he says. And Jesus quotes Jeremiah, Thus saith the Lord, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. And I went, Wow. These stiff-necked people... The Lord says, you shall find rest, walk in his path. And how the people respond, we will not walk in it. It took me a couple minutes, I'm sitting there. I stopped and I'm like thinking there's something I'm missing here. It was like the Holy Spirit whacked me, whacked me on the side of the head and say, you know, you're sometimes no different than the Israelites. How many times where I know maybe I should be something I'm not, and I put it off, and I choose not to walk in it. I think of the Israelites. Joshua and Caleb with the other ten spies, twelve spies, go out and saw, and they saw a beautiful land that it was theirs. Yes, we can conquer it. Let's do this. What the Israelites do, we will not walk in it. We will not take that path. And because they chose not to take that path, they suffered for 40 years in the wilderness. You may feel like you're in the wilderness because you are. I know what it's like, and I hate being in the wilderness. It's not a fun place to be. It stinks, it's hot, it, whatever you can think about it, it's not nice, and, and I like variety. I, I would have been complaining like the Israelites, you give me two choices of food, manna and the birds, uh, I like shrimp, <laughs> or whatever it is, steak, you, you name it. Um, no. But sometimes God allows us to be in the wilderness. But it is not his desire for us to stay there. And usually from our mistakes we learn a lot. I probably learn more from mistakes. So... When I see someone make a mistake, I try not to get too bent out of shape because I'm thinking, you know what? God's working in your life. He's going to teach you. He's showing you. There's hope. But Jeremiah says, find rest for your souls. And the people say, we will not. So one of the challenges I ask myself and you is that when confronted with something, will you walk in it? Will you go to the yoke where Jesus is and pick it up? Uh, he already has it picked up. You're just joining in. Will it be easy? No. Is it supposed to be easy? I think we have seasons. Sometimes it is, and probably most times it's not. At work, if there's a saying, if it was easy, the Girl Scouts would be doing it. I guess that's not politically correct to say that, but uh, they probably do a lot of good, but yet uh, it's not easy. The, the Christian life, the walk, and trusting in God is not easy, but yet it is so rewarding. And when you experience the success or the joy of sitting with Jesus and taking it in. There's nothing else in the world like it because he is so amazing. The next passage is one that we all know and might be difficult to read, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. One of the things I will say to people, and sometimes it used to irritate my wife, and sometimes I really try not to irritate Lynn, but I think it's a, a natural thing men know how to do. Uh, but anyways, 
have you ever thought about, and I'd like you to think this, because we don't think this way, when you're confronted in a situation, you're not sure what to do, whatever you're thinking, do the exact opposite. Oh, I'm telling you, try it. Do the exact opposite. Why do I say this? Because I think, including myself, we make too many decisions based on the flesh. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, that word trust, to rely on, put confidence in. You're putting your trust and confidence in Him. And what's the next phrase? Lean not on your own understanding. So when you think of something sometimes and you're not sure, and you do what you think, what are you doing? You're leaning on your own understanding. Do the exact opposite and try it and see what happens. Oh, it's scary. But when you find out, it's like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, examples. Uh, I'm better in this area than what I used to be, but when I was a younger parent, I'd get frustrated with Dan, our son, and I'd get upset. Because that's where I went. Well, why don't you try doing the opposite? Because <laughs> that's not what I think of. Go the opposite direction. So when I treat him kindly, when maybe I see something that I don't like, it changes everything. But what's my natural action? I can't believe you did that. Where's your head? <laughs> that really gets, gets you somewhere, doesn't it? Not really. But it's hard, because that means you have to stop and think about who you are, what you're doing, what you're saying. That means you're taking self-assessment, and that's hard, because that's a tough place to go. Because you're admitting then, there's a possibility that I'm wrong. We hate to be wrong, I hate to be wrong, but we can be wrong. Uh, some of you may remember this, a classic episode with the Happy Days where Fonzie had to admit that he was wrong and he said, I was... Uh, does anybody remember that? Put your hand up. I see those hands, yeah. I was... He couldn't... It, it was like almost impossible to come out. I get it. We don't like to think we're wrong. We're more wrong than what we think. This is the verse that when it was introduced to me, it changed my life. This is my life verse. Psalm 51, 6, But behold, you desire truth in inmost being, and in the hidden parts you will make me know wisdom. I memorized it in the King James, but thou desirest truth in the utmost parts. So when I was deceived, and I'm sure there's areas where I still am deceived but don't know it, and when they're pointed out, I have to respond. But the truth set me free. Jesus says that in John. All of us, I believe, we believe lies. And when we do, we're deceived. I'm going to finish up and we'll get out of here a little early today. Maybe. <laughs> it's okay. One of the areas that I was deceived in, and this is what basically how God worked it and changed me, through counseling, it was discovered, and some of you heard part of this testimony before. If you have, you're going to hear it again. Because it's a story about my God, my Savior, Jesus. One of the things that 
And here again, this was in 1994. I'm 34. I have a Bible degree. I can say I accomplished a lot. You know what? That doesn't mean anything <laughs> based on what I'm going to share with you. One of the deepest areas in my life that really was the root of why I was so messed up, still messed up but in a different way, a different degree, is that I believed that Jesus loved everybody but me. John 3.16, for God so loved the world but Brian. If you knew the thoughts inside of me, there's no way you'd want to love me. No way. And through counseling and being exposed, now you're dealing with life issues. Now guess what, guys? I used to have thought I was half decent. Now I'm really bad. How could Jesus love me? And when I told Jesus that I didn't think you loved me, it hit me that I was deceived for the first time. <laughs> oh, in my head I knew he loved me, but not my heart. Big difference. And Jesus radically changed me when I was no longer deceived in this area. And I believe that he loved me with all my baggage, with all my sin, with all my thoughts that are disgusting. He loves me. And he changed my heart. I didn't even know he changed me. Because I didn't know how to change. And what was interesting, I remember my wife, after this time period, uh, I struggled with my uh, mother-in-law. My monster-in-law, I mean my mother-in-law. And she's really a nice person, but that's what I used to think. And after a number of times going to Lynn's parents' place, my wife noticed and said, Brian, you treat my mom totally different. I do? What do you mean I do? In fact, you treat other people different. What? I didn't know. God changed my heart, and he didn't whack me over the head and tell me that he changed my heart. <laughs> People had a solid difference in me, and I didn't see the difference in myself. And then I began to think it through. Wow, I am different and didn't even know I was different. That was the encouraging thing for me, because I couldn't change myself. And maybe you're sitting here today thinking, you may not understand. It's okay, I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> But I know where you go to get the answer. And that's Jesus and his word. And maybe your issue isn't like mine was. Jesus, you don't love me. But now I know he does. You could be, the issue could be totally different where you're deceived. I don't know. You don't know. Because if you knew, you wouldn't be deceived. So my prayer not just for me, but for you, is that the areas where you are deceived, that whether it's the Word, whether it's your good friend, time with Jesus, or who knows what, that you will be shown. And then when you're shown, you're faced with a decision. And that's where you, God works. So, for me, 
it's a tough place to start. Like I said earlier, for three years plus, when Lynn said you needed help, I refused. So for you guys out there, or women, I would say be patient with your spouse. Because if they're deceived and you see it, they don't know until they're shown. And then I think Lynn in her own way, she really tried hard to show me. But I didn't believe her. I didn't place trust in that area. And I know it frustrated her. Uh, someone could say if I think a lot of marriages don't survive. It's hard to communicate. It's hard to be brutally honest with your mate <laughs> because you don't know how they're going to respond. But through counseling, I learned to be honest to the core. It has helped our relationship. What's cool now is Lynn knows how rotten I am and she loves me. <laughs> That's how I know she loves me because she knows how bad I am. <laughs> If you only saw how good I was, it might be easy. But it's not. And in that struggle, when I tell her, confess my sin to her and to God, she's thankful. It gives hope because it's out of the closet, you know? I'm not harboring a secret. Here it is, this is who I am. Sometimes you'll say, well, do we need to sit down for this? Is, is this going to be mind-blowing? No, it's not, but I just need to tell you. And guess what? When she knows, it's no longer a secret. Then the desire disappears. It's not as, uh, and I said, tell you what, Lynn, it's so much better living in reality than fantasy. And if you keep it to yourself, it's a fantasy. If you share and you deal with it and gain victory over it, it's a reality. You can deal with what you can see and what you hear. But how do you live and deal with fantasy when it's unknown? You can't. You know something's wrong, but you don't know what it is. That's why the truth sets us free. I think Ernie said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So through all this today, truth, what conforms to reality and contrasts to what is false. It's my desire for myself and for everyone that we focus on and pursue truth. Period. Truth. It's found in the Word. And sometimes, like me, someone had to show me the Word because I didn't see clearly my blind spot. And those are, I shared two blind spots. I do my best and try not to shift blame anymore and, and take responsibility. I try not to get defensive. And I know that Jesus loves me. And that's good. I'm going to pray in the praise team.